The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in his flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, so they should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. I have often shared uh, that I have a great amount of love and curiosity when it comes to Jesus' parables. I find them to be intellectually stimulating, multifaceted, and timeless. And as a preacher, a learner, and follower, I appreciate how parables rely upon a metaphoric voice to broaden our understanding of God and our spiritual lives. So the first thing I want to do is point out a couple of oddities in today's parable. First, apparently people in hell can communicate with those in eternal bliss. I mean, this is what the entire parable is, is based upon. And I believe that this connection is critical in the interpretation. And second, there's a dog in the story, but we're going to get to that in a little bit. So, to sort of recap, in this parable, the rich man is on fire, and still, he drives much of the parabolic conversation. This is both surprising and interesting, since in the parable, we're initially led to believe that there's a very definitive fence that's been erected between the rich man and the poor man creating a chasm that cannot absolute, can absolutely cannot be crossed. Well, this separation is not unexpected. What is unexpected is the rich man has found himself on the wrong side of the fence. This is a first, first century world where a distinct fence lines were erected all over the place. The poor belong here, with here not being a blissful and abundant place, and the rich belong over here, with here not being a hellish and deathly place. And these two yards should never, ever meet. It's quite, quite clear. Lazarus, in our parable, really did nothing to become poor. He was simply born into it. Just as the rich man did very little to get rich, he was just simply born into it. It was all somewhat predetermined, based on societal structures, social class, race, and religion. And if we're honest, things aren't really so different in our 21st century world. Now, while we may recognize that Lazarus was poor because rich men of the world devalued and oppressed and stepped on him and others like him, the rich men then didn't see it that way at all. They saw wealth and success as an expression of God's or the God's generosity and favor, which was only given to certain chosen people. So those who had were entitled to what they had, because it had been gifted to them. So metaphorical fences were needed between the rich and the poor, the chosen and the damned, the clean and the filthy. As we all know, fences are very effective at setting boundaries. But the rich man, he is completely surprised to find himself on the wrong side of the fence, seemingly separated from God. And the text seems to support this notion of separation. 
Between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. I mean, how are we to make sense of this, especially as people who arguably live on the abundant light, of the abundant and lavish side of the fence? Our grass is green. Does it mean we're damned in the afterlife that we've already received our reward? The first thing I think is important to state the obvious. Inequality, especially gross inequality, threatens the very nature of our civil society, our politics, healthcare, education, housing, employment, and legal systems. Second, wealth and power have the potential to threaten our relationships with God and with others. This isn't to say that wealth is intrinsically evil, but it's definitely dangerous. And we're all susceptible to its seductive powers. And third, I must wrestle with and confess that there are people in this world who could live for two days on what I spend on a Starbucks latte. Many people suffer daily from the catastrophic consequences of poverty. I personally do not. This is not condemnation. It is purely truth. A truth that I must admit that I live in. This is a hard parable because it, causes, it calls us to take a hard look at the ways we fence ourselves off from others, whether it's by hoarding love, money, time, forgiveness, or mercy. Because initially, the rich man thinks life is found only on his side of the fence. He believed this to be true for today and tomorrow, on earth and in heaven, in this life and the next. He and many others believe that the green grass of life is comprised of money, prestige, and power. But Jesus would say that the rich man's grass had been fertilized with hoarding, isolation, and dictatorship, not God's generosity and grace. So that's a rough side of the parable, right? But we look at everything through the lens, of, and, lens and promise of Jesus. And so I offer this. A long time ago, when I lived in Virginia, my boys were young, and we had a fence around our backyard. All of my neighbors had fences, too. Of course, we were very neighborly, and so we had gates which connected all of the yards, so the kids could easily pass through them at appropriate times. We also all had dogs, all four of our yards. And as you probably know, dogs don't always listen, neither do kids, but <laughs> dogs look at fences differently than people do. We see fences as protection. Dogs see fences as barriers. Dogs know that beyond the fence, life and freedom awaits. <laughs> so I think that dogs can teach us a bit about life. Now, lest we romanticize this, let me first point out that the dogs in the parable today probably weren't much to look at. I mean, we are not talking about a pack of golden retrievers here with thick flowing coats and brown doe eyes and wagging tails. These are likely mangy, skinny mutts who ran from place to place with their tails between their legs, just hoping not to get beaten. And I'd also like to point out that the dogs licking the wounds of poor Lazarus, it's pretty gross, right? I mean, occasionally my dog gets fixated on a bump or a scratch on her skin and starts licking, and the whole licking process is sort of gross. I mean, she's oh, so adamant about it. She licks and she licks and she licks and the constant slurping. I mean, it just makes my skin crawl. <laughs> and Lazarus is covered in wounds which are pussy and oozy, and there's maybe flies and maggots that have gathered around him. He's got debris stuck to him. And he probably doesn't smell that great either, and the dog is licking him over and over and over again. I mean, this is the good news part of the sermon. <laughs> in ancient times, dogs were used in healing practices. The Greeks had held the belief, and also in their temples, that when their temples that were dedicated to the god of medicine, their temples contained dogs that were trained to lick wounds. And they believed that the dog saliva had healing properties. And I've heard that some people think that's true today, too. But at the time the parable was told, it was definitely a school of thought. So 
So yeah, since I adore metaphors, I'm going to offer the interpretation of Jesus being a dog, which is probably good news to Pastor Steve. <laughs> now, it's not because I think that this is all about the dog. It's definitely not. not. Because dogs fell backwards with God because they're the perfect reflection of dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but because I believe that the dog's vantage point says a lot about God's vantage point. And because Jesus spent his life running from place to place, indiscriminately offering love and healing, seeking scraps wherever he went, and getting beaten. He lived the life of a dog. But this, these dogs, regardless of how beautiful or lowly they are, they don't leave Lazarus. Everyone else does, but not the dog. And for those who love dogs, right, we know that nothing beats their constant attention and devotion. But for those who love Jesus, it matters that he promises to never leave, no matter what. But what are we to think, then, about the rich man? I mean, this is good news for Lazarus. I mean, but no dog for him? No Jesus for him? I mean, I think the real question for this parable is, was the rich man actually alive in this life? I mean, while he was eating sumptuously, ignoring the needs of others, living safely behind the walls, and never seeing what was going on outside in the world, was he actually living the kind of life worth living, at least according to God? I mean, the parable makes it pretty clear that basically the rich man is alive in death, and as the parable points out, he was dead in this life on earth. Much to his dismay, he discovers that his whole life, his life on earth and his life in the afterlife, was basically a living death. However, according to Jesus, there is one way to die that leads to life. Jesus teaches us the truth that when you lose your life, then and only then will you find it. The rich man never died the proper kind of death in this life, the kind that leads to true life today and life eternal. And so then, is, is life lost? Is all lost for the rich man? But well, what's the one thing that a dog hopes for as he sits behind a fence? A dog hopes for a gap, right? A way through. The rich man's only hope now is a gap in the fence as he lays tormented in hell. And Lazarus' only hope is a gap in the fence as he lays tormented on earth. I mean, the story says that Lazarus was hungry and poor and lowly. It says nothing about whether he was a believing hungry or a believing poor person, or a believing lowly person. I mean, he too might have needed a gap in the fence, just not in the same manner as the rich man. See, the sad, sad thing about this parable is both the rich man and Lazarus were robbed of life on this side of the fence. And Jesus doesn't want that for anyone. I feel as if Jesus must have chuckled as he recounted the rich man's closing closing plea. No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. And he's probably grinning again with Abraham's work back, words back to the rich man. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. I mean, he had to be cracking a smile, right? I mean, here, Jesus foreshadows his death and resurrection. And maybe Abraham in the parable doesn't believe that they'll be convinced by someone rising from but Jesus does. Because the reason this parable doesn't really conclude or offer a solid ending is because Jesus is the ending. And we don't know if the rich man stayed in hell, but we do know one thing about Jesus. Jesus, the lover of life, was sent for all and died for all and was raised for all. And I believe that there's always hope. Because the resurrection says once and for all that there's a gap in the fence. And Jesus snaps down all the fences and says, Come, live life like a dog. Run and feast and heal and love everyone you meet. 